Mind Crime Limited Show with me, Swimming Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss why do people have children? Now, if we were doing this podcast, say, 300 years ago, which of course we wouldn't, but if we were, people would think this was a very odd question because children just kind of happened. Various biological processes take place and, oh, wait, we have a child. However, since the 19th century, especially into the 20th century, uh, there is now reliable contraceptive methods. And so that if you don't want to have children but have sex, you can. So the question is, well, why do people still bother having children? Tim. As you say, with the technology point, um, this is now a question before in, in times past. It wasn't really a feasible question. Uh, I mean, the first answer is instinct. Um, if you're an evolutionary naturalist, I mean, to some extent, we're just reproductive vehicles in some ways. We just sort of multiply just like rats, uh, bacteria or any other thing. So instinct, of course, you know, other mammals and so forth. Uh, anthropologists have identified groups who don't know how children are formed. Or, or whether whether one should trust anthropologists is of some question. Um, you know, maybe we just don't, don't know how to communicate with them, the sort of tribe or society that doesn't know how the children are formed. But it's not surprising. I mean, that in theory, a group can understand. It takes a while to see the effects. Um, you can do the process and not have children. I mean, anyone that doesn't, m many couples have this problem. Um, it takes a while to see the effects, of course, at least a month or two. And again, some people are pregnant and not even aware of it. There's those cases too. I mean, it's easier to recognize animals with shorter, uh, you know, reproduction cycles, but nonetheless, that's a guess. Um, and also, again, it, it just sort of happens. This is one of the points that the pro-life person made versus Walter Block in the Soho Forum debate on abortion. A lot of like, uh, uh, a lot of pro, uh, what's well, a lot of pro-choice people and Walter Block, in a way, operates in this thing. Even Walter Block had a strange position. I'm not here to talk about this. But if there's no technology, the whole process of sex with no protection, the, 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 the result, it's not like an accident a child happens. That's like the main cause of why a child, you know, it, that's the correct process uh, in a way. I mean, if you just, you know, if, if two horses were to, to have... And then third horse results. It's the same process here. Uh, it's not really a mystery here. Um, so in some ways, you know, you're trying to dam up a river or you're adding agency into it. You know, neither the male nor the female, outside of the act itself, of course, neither the male nor female can really choose whether or not they can have a children outside of their health. I mean, of course, you could be healthy or unhealthy. There's other factors there, too. Uh, but. You know, again, and also this is of interest to me because in, in a way we still have leftover taboos about talking about sex um, in our society. That's another interesting thing. That's another reason why I want to have this discussion here, because we still sort of have those effects. People view it as a private matter. I mean, in our societies, of course, everyone knows how they're well, most everyone knows how they're formed, uh, how you get children. Um, so that's another leftover taboo, so to speak. Um, here. Um, so again, why do people have children here? So Swithin, I've sort of laid out a case. It's just instinct. That's the first thing. Um, you know, it, whatever you think of instinct, natural cause events, which is interesting, but of course now we can't do it. So this has changed society. Um, this has changed society a lot here because now it's a choice. And since it's been a choice, birth rates have basically went down to two in places like Asia, they're already down to one. They're going that way here in like United States and Britain. There are some groups, interestingly, and this is this is entitled the book Fundamentals Shall It Hurt the Hurt the Earth Secular Yale. I think it's maybe it's Stanford Political Science wrote this book. There's certain groups, of course, that have their birth rates off the charts here. And since we have no infant mortality deaths, really, or de facto none, they maintain them all. So there are some people that 100% choose to do it, and they choose to have a lot of them, Amish, some uh, Muslims, some Jews, Orthodox Jews, and so forth. So I think, what do you make about the choice factor here, as well as the taboo point? Um, why do people have children? And the instinct point, I made some comments here. What do you think, Swithin? Well, I think instinct, I suppose you could say, is um, even with humans, still possibly one of the biggest drivers, although 
Um, the instinct um, plays a part. Well, the instinct uh, creates sort of self-reflection uh, amongst um, the parties. Um, so they will think, well, OK, um, I have this sort of in women in particular, this sort of maternal urge. I I feel like I ought to have a child. You know, it feels right. It's sort of an instinct. Uh, and also, you know, they'll um, reflect probably implicitly rather than explicitly on the fact that, you know, they had a mother. The mother, in most cases, would have sort of raised and had a, a close relationship with the children the father would. And this is something that um, that you know, they want to sort of uh, replicate. Um, related to that as well, I suppose you could say you could say that um, the drive for having children is um, a the, the clearest manifestation of sort of the natural uh, natural sociality of man. That is, man is a social creature; he wants other people around him, and so obviously. Is it worth the most social thing you can do is produce more people, because if you didn't, well, you wouldn't have anyone to be social with. Um, so I think that's um, a, a relevant uh, factor. Um, as for uh, so, so, I mean, related to that as well. Uh, I mean, this is sort of beyond instinct, as, as it were, but people will, might think, well, Although now they probably don't to the same extent, but you could argue historically that you would want children to look after you in your old age. That would be a reason to do it. Um, I know, for instance, that of people who take the view that, well, they want to get married and have children because they kind of like want to have some people around when they're old. I mean, not necessarily for financial support, but it kind of um, imbues people with some sense of meaning because People always want something that will make an impact in the future. Uh, I think they're always um, making and having uh, sort of success. Well, not well, well, success to be success. You have to have to have achieved it. But you want to be engaged in um, a never sort of a never ending goal. But one way you think you're sort of making an impact on it because it's always there. It means you've never achieved it fully, which means you always have a reason to go on. Because if you go to a situation where you have completed everything you possibly wanted to do, then the question is, well, why don't you commit suicide? Children, on the other hand, avoid that problem because they'll probably outlive you. And so the project continues. Um, so I think that's possibly. Now, not explicitly, I don't think, but implicitly why uh, a lot of people uh, I think have them it basically gives you something to do um, the fundamentalist shall inherit the earth theory is interesting uh, the theory of there is that um, because that you can basically now choose to have children uh, the people who will have children are those who are genetically more predisposed to having them because environmental factors now don't really push you to uh, have as many children anymore um, children in current Western society are expensive, uh, significantly more expensive than they were historically, uh, as a proportion of income, that is, as well. And also they are not productive economic units until they're significantly older. So you kind of reduce the, the birth rates. So you mentioned Asia. Uh, South Korea is the country with the lowest birth rate in the world. And as of, I think it was 2019, their average birth rate was like 0.87 uh, 0.87 uh, children uh, per woman on average, which obviously means that the birth rate, uh, the, the um, population will go down. Replacement rates are at 2.1 because not all women have children. So you'd need more than two just depending on the levels of mortality and stuff. Um, so when it comes to uh, who will have children, the, uh, the argument goes that, well, Eventually, the people who start breeding more than everybody else be those who are genetically more predisposed to breeding. And eventually they'll outbreed everybody else. And so there'll be a permanent sort of pro natalist um, uh, sort of disposition amongst the, pop the world. And so actually, whilst it's true that the world population will probably go down, I think over the next 50 years, I think, I can't remember which year the UN says is going to, 
um, start going down, it will eventually start going up again. Um, that's the um, that's the theory there. Um, so I think back to your original point. I think instinct makes a um, a, a large uh, impact, but again, it, it sort of manifests differently in humans than it is, say, in horses or sheep, for instance. So that'll be some of my opening um, remarks. Yeah, humans are very much civil, air quote, civilized humans are very much different than horses. Well, horses are somewhat domesticated, but uh, purely wild animals, if such things exist um, at this point. Um, but they're much different than like birds or rats in that regard. Um, so instinct is a sort of funny thing. I mean, I think Nietzsche's would call humans the philosophical beast. Um, um, so I, and I think, I think, you know, sex and reproduction have become intellectualized in a lot of ways. Um, and, and this, this, this is another interest to me because you get books like the Unwin book, Sex and Culture. Um, um, so it, which is how you get, you know, family, you know, in some ways family is a kind of technology or Neil Ferguson would call it a killer app to use Neil Ferguson par parlance here. Uh, but what's interesting is now is Many people, again, choose, have the option and don't have them. The book, your point about them being costly is interesting. But one of the things that those movements that Eric Kaufman identify, if you look deeper into them, is they actually make the children cheaper to have by putting them to work on their farm or putting them work in the local their, their own business. You know, a lot of these groups, you know, will have them, you know. And again, people on the outside will say that's terrible. We've done episodes, whether you think public schools are public schools are kind of work anyway um but um they'll sort of reduce the cost and they won't send them to college so again that'll reduce the cost they won't drive them around so there's certain ways to reduce the cost but again choice here is the interesting factor here and this is a choice that's not really talked about um but it's probably it's probably if you think about like the political you know the concept of the political it's probably one of those political having children in a certain ways is a socio-political act here um you know as you pointed out uh uh you know you want a legacy of some kind brian kaplan will make the argument he wrote selfish regions to have more kids will make a sort of it's kind of a headed hedonistic consumerism now you know some traditionalists would probably quiver at that i'm not really a traditionalist in that regard i think that's a perfectly acceptable reason to have children um you know you just want um you know you just want to, you want to have more people like you around um, so, you know, you just pass on your legacy here. And that's what relates to my second point I have here on my list of reasons, which is labor force, too. They are a kind of labor force um, in a way. Now, again, currently they're not. Um, from my understanding, that's one of the primary reasons why uh, pe people want to have children so they can get take care of when they're elderly. Uh, uh, that, that's if you go to a place like Taiwan, I think for a large portion whether this is true in all cases of some question or whether just an urban legend is that people still, there's not much of a, there's not much of a safety net. They need children to take care of them when they're elderly or they'll also be destitute. Um, so that's a sort of labor force. But again, this is another interesting thing about late modernity with this sort of large, you know, managerial therapeutic state is that's been, you know, been um, outsourced to the, you know, the state nursing homes or the state, whatever. Um, so even that's been somewhat taken away for the middle class and above. Um, so so the, so again, choice it's it, it, it choice or it, it becomes a kind of choice. Um, you, you can choose to have sex if you want with birth control. And I, again, I, in our abortion episode, I did bring up that area uh, whether that's a kind of uh, murder in a sense um, is an interesting question here. But nonetheless. Those are my the hedonistic consumerism and the labor force are the two. I, I'd say the since the labor force in micro terms no longer exists in macro terms it exists, uh, which is why at some point governments might actually start wanting their populace to have more children. Singapore has tried to do certain things to bring up its birth rate, but they've done quite poorly at it. Um, um, uh, so so th those would be my if you move on, and again, the religious argument of hedonistic consumerism, although they wouldn't call it that, it is a kind of legacy too. Uh, you know, you want to have I think, something like arrows full of of your own quiver full of whatever. Uh, I think is the line. Um, so there is a sort of religious argument 
Um, again, and a lot of what's interesting is like the churches that here in the United States that have attendance are generally filled of the net of the current generation's next generation and the churches that don't people who don't have children there. And that's another one of the side arguments made in that book, too, um, um, that if you look into um, that, you know, the best way to get attendance is to create is to uh, create your own um, um, population here. Um, so those would be the point, labor force and a sort of legacy hedonist consumerism. Um, those would be my sort of three reasons there. What do you make of that, Swithin? Uh, do you have any areas of disagreement here? Uh, what would you make of that? Well, I was uh, going to riff off um, your comment about Singapore. Um, with the uh, modern welfare states around the world, uh, very low birth rates are a problem because um, the elderly are dependent on the states in their old age rather than their own resources, which means you have to have a large tax base. But if you have an average, if the average age of the population is going up, the dependency ratio, that is the proportion of people uh, who don't work, the people who do, I think it's that's the way around, goes up. And so you need more people. And um, the bank, so China have recently got rid of the one child policy and now have two. Uh, and recently, the People's Bank of China, which is a Chinese central bank, put out a paper saying um, we need to scrap it in its entirety and we need to encourage women to have like three or more children because otherwise the Chinese population will decrease. And this will be bad for China. Um, financially speaking, it'll be bad as well. Um, so related to uh, sort of the reason why some people have it, I think various minority groups if they, I think this, you could argue, explains the Jews to some extent. Although actually, the more secular Jews have very, very low birth rates. The Orthodox ones have high ones. Is uh, if you feel that your group is um, valuable, then what you need to do is you, well, obviously you need to prevent intermarriage uh, with other groups and marry within your own group and have as many children as possible to grow the group. So then the group is. Um, stronger and will continue into the future because you see yourself as part of the group and you have a uh, sort of an obligation to uh do your part to make sure the group continues into the future um i think that is um certainly a reason some people have it. Uh, with sort of selfish sort of hedonism from brian kaplan i suppose it depends what you mean by hedonism I'm not wishing to go to a semantic uh debate I mean, people who have children tend to like having children uh, so in certain respects. And so say it's uh, purely like a consumption good. Well, I suppose it is in a way, but they're kind of not the um, not the least effort consumption good, if that makes sense. Um, so calling it just on sort of a, a consumption good like that just seems to be slightly odd given the requirements of children. I suppose uh, you could claim somebody who had children and then sent them off to a nanny and someone else to raise them. And you only saw them at certain times. Yeah. Uh, and when they were happy, like all oh, play toys with them, then yes, maybe you could probably call that um, consumption. Um, but um, but otherwise, uh, I, 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 I can see his point. But I, I, I think that probably isn't the best way of describing it. Although it is cl clearly true that people do have children today, do want them. Although interestingly, they tend to only want, well, most people seem to at least want one child. So they have the idea that a child as such is required and good in a way, but then they don't really have any more than that. Well, that's at least seemingly the experience, say, in South Korea, uh, for instance. So. The, so it would seem to be that people have the idea that you should have a child. And again, why you should have that is another question. Um, but then they don't tend to multiply because oh, well, that'd be too much effort because I can't. Uh, well, the main reason that the birth rates are probably lower is that uh, women now see ha have higher social status from working in a corporation than they do from having children and lots of them, because if they did, they would have more children. Um, that would be the main one of the main drivers and also on the also why you have children um as an aside i think one of the reasons why women typically have a seemingly have a stronger drive to have children than men do is that women are reminded every month that they do not have a child 
and the body is going, hmm, you might want one. Whereas men, because basically they can have children up to like the age of like 70, 75, it doesn't really particularly matter when they have a child. They can always perform and in principle make it happen. Whereas a woman can basically perform for, well, maybe 26 years between the ages of 14. Well, I suppose it could be younger on occasion. But 14 and 40. I know you can get it over 40, but you extend it. Oh, yeah, let's say 45. Let's go, let's go 14, 44, say 30 years. Whereas a guy is like, what, 60? Uh, so I think that explain at least in part, the relative um, uh, propen- um, sort of desire, as it were, to have children. Because men can always delay it in a way women can't. Um, but as to the exact reasons why, I mean, people don't have them now for financial reasons, primarily. Um, I think it's a way of sort of extending oneself into the future, which I think is partly sort of genetic and part of their reflection on uh, themselves and what they sort of consider meaningful. Other than that, presupp- then that begs the question, why do they think having children is a sort of a valuable sort of activity? Uh, then you could answer in terms of sort of purely Darwinian terms you could do traditional natural law uh, you could go divine command as well um, but um, I think those are some of the major reasons why people do have children the Kaplan point uh, Ayn Rand plays with the Kaplan's a Randy in certain sense and Ayn Rand makes a strange use of the word selfish um, um, so you know which is is somewhat of a semantics point Somewhat, somewhat, you should just, uh, one of her three A's, of course, was the Aristotle. So to a certain extent, she's just viewing as a, you know, if you, Kaplan's just saying it's a higher form of consumption, whether that distinction actually exists. I just think it's interesting there what Kaplan's making. If you want to look for a secular uh, pronatal position, there it is. Um, um, so what did I say? The fact that you need reasons now, I, I still think have changed, changed the game since roughly 1960 here. Uh, significantly and will change the game wherever birth control writ large goes. Um, in, in eventually, I think Iran's birth rate is going down. Uh, my, my guess is that other places will go down too. And you, you know, the, the China one child policy, you know, made a government, made a trend that was going to happen normally, uh, not normally, air quote, with economic development generally drives down children after some point. Um, that's occurred in almost every society. Um, um, uh, sort of legal role, um, and uh, and they will their population is already going to contract uh, by a significant amount. I think it will be under a billion, <clears throat> and they've peaked. This is a point that Peter Zeeland makes um, um, in his uh, in his sort of defense of you know America. Amer- America is the only like developed society that still has a millennial has a generation here, a, a significant cohort uh, here. And again, your point about mi- micro or macro. Uh, you know, on a micro level, you don't need it since the state can just supply you. But your point about labor force, this is what's interesting is this choice of having children sort of underlies a lot of political debates that happen. I mean, again, if more, people had more children, immigration wouldn't be needed and also immigration wouldn't be a threat. If you raise the domestic birth rate to three, a lot of this sort of doomsday scenarios that some people painted out, just three, not five, just three in like Britain, a lot of the doomsday scenarios that certain of the, you know, uh, uns- the deplorable people will say uh, won't won't happen to the degree they will. Just three or even three and a half. Um, so it's a sort of a political question that sort of affects a lot of things here. And Eric Weinstein, which is Peter Thiel's um, 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 uh, uh, advice uh, for his uh, what I call hedge fund or investment, whatever, uh, made the point once that I think is true is that. In a in when birth rates are going down, all institutions turn into zero sum Ponzi schemes. Um, that's a point that he made in the interview with Dave Rubin, which I've which I've chewed on for like six years. When birth rates go down, all all institutions become um, you know, zero sum Ponzi schemes in a lot of ways. So like you know if any institution is dependent somewhat on growth or maintenance. So like if you have thirty, if if your if your town has a hundred people. And in 10 years, it's going to have, let's say, 100,000 people. In 10 years, it's going to have 70,000 people. You'll need 30 less teachers, 30 less college professors. I'm just making the, the proportional numbers up. Uh, uh, but if you, if you say X, you know, or 30 less lawyers or 30 less firefighters. Now, of course, there'll be less 
service there, so that might go down too. But during the time when growth happens, um, um, which is sort of the retort to the population bomb, which again is sort of why that happened. So there's a certain sense that having children is a supremely political thing, uh, 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 and and which sort of relies some of the sort of quote unquote dystopian political fiction that we have, like Handmaid's Tale, where a society where you have people compelled to having them. So, so then what do you make about the political aspect of having um, children here? Again, there's sort of micro, but the sort of macro meta politics of having children. What do you make of that then? Would you agree that it sort of underlies a lot of issues which people normally wouldn't think of? Oh, you know, my decision to have children, if I multiply it on thing, oh, that's why colleges are so like death nail, or that's why certain like fights between you know, you have declining institutions fighting over a shrinking piece of the pie, which makes the, you know, fighting even more uh, 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 life or death here. What, what do you make of that, Swither? That's an interesting point. I don't think I really consider, I, I may have heard it in reference to um, the college system, uh, the university system before. I mean, that does make a lot of sense, um, that if you do have a dwindling pie to sort of, um uh, to 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 capture that market, as it were, then you know you're going to fight as hard as you can over it. So uh, I do think that makes sense. I suppose as well, indirectly, uh, I suppose the birth rates uh, argument, uh, you could say, influences sort of immigration policy. Now, would it really be the case? Would corporations stop asking for free immigration, even if there was lots more like uh, higher domestic birth rates? Probably not. Um, but the argument that, um, oh, there's a labor shortage or uh, we don't have enough people to do certain jobs would would seem to be a, th- there would be less of a justification for that. Now, of course, you could always think of another justification for it. Um, but I think that uh, certainly does impact it. I suppose on the side, uh, the, the, assuming that voting works, you could argue that the left support of immigration is a way of sort of maintaining um oh it's bizarre though because the immigrants don't agree with them to a large extent but i think why they want to capture immigrant voting blocks because their birth rates are so low that they won't replicate themselves so can't continue their social programs into the future whereas the right in general i'm pretty sure this is true uh i haven't seen the data directly but i'm pretty sure if you identify as relatively right wing you're going to have more children if you're left wing and that's pretty you go, that's going to be generally true and so the right can replenish its birth it, it, it's a sort of voting block in a way that the left can't so the left needs to sort of co-opt other voting blocks um so that um they can sort of continue their influence into the future because they're basically breeding themselves out of the gene pool um, this, of course, though, assumes that voting matters uh, to the extent to which it doesn't. Uh, it wouldn't explain much. That said, to the extent that people do believe it matters, then that could that would at least impact their rhetoric, at least implicitly. I'm not saying they're doing this explicitly. Eh? That would be an odd. I, I suppose some of them might. Some of the more self-aware ones might. Um, but I, I doubt that many leftists go, yes, we have no children. Let's bring in the Somalis. I don't necessarily think that's uh, what they're thinking. I, it's not necessarily what they're thinking, but it does it is underlie it does underlie things. Um, what do you make about the taboo topic um, here? Um, this still remains a taboo topic to talk about. You don't if you, it's like you asking someone how much they weigh or or whatever. Um, what do you make of that still existing um, taboo and the fact that uh, you know y- y- this is just not not brought up here. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, it is oh, do, now do, do, a choice do, here. Do, 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 what do you mean? Like, why don't you have any children? That question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I think because. For well, example, well, if, you, if you ask someone, why didn't you go on vacation or why didn't you go to this school instead of that school? No one's going to say, oh, that's an unreasonable question. Or why do you take this job instead of that job? But this topic still remains a sore spot. Uh, that 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 to me, and it's sort of under 
if you look at the articles about like self, you know, there are various articles about all things, but this thing, there's no natal section on a website or something like that, at least most websites, but, but due to its importance, um, it is quite interesting that it remains. I, it's sort of a leftover from a sort of Victorian Moors, in my opinion, but I... Well I, I, I think it's probably due in part to the fact that, at least in some cases, uh, it's not a choice not to have any children or to have the number that they do, because it may be sort of relative sort of um, infertility or various medical ailments which prevent them from um, prevent them from conceiving. So I think that's sort of uh, an extension of the. Um, the extension of that sort of general taboo of asking about medical details about them um because people tend not to like to do that except of course when they're being vaccinated against a particularly undeadly disease in which case they'll tell you immediately um but in the main they're like, oh no 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 um, um they don't really talk so i think it's that and the problem that um there is always um that as an issue now if it now would be interesting if it was the case that everybody suppose medical advances were so great pretty so that mm, genetic engineering would make that any child born could always um conceive somehow um because i'm pretty sure some genetic disorders mean you can't uh but suppose you could get rid of those and so that in principle, there was no impediment for doing so. And even if you couldn't do it naturally, you could do it via IVF, that that was so cheap and easy and reliable that it would work. Then the question of taboo would be interesting, would be even more interesting. But I do think it is interesting anyway. It's like, well, why didn't you have more children? I mean, for somebody who obviously had children, you could, you know, it seems really to go, well, why don't you have any more? But people don't tend to ask that. Um I suppose they think it's somewhat of a private matter. Although I think this, to a large extent, though, comes down to the um, privatization, as it were, of marriage in general. Uh, but now, what do I mean by that? Um, is that your parents don't really have any influence, have that much impact into who you marry these days? Uh, insofar as you'd have sort of arranged marriage, then there would be a lot more sort of social pressure to do stuff, and at least your parents, particularly, would go uh i don't have any kids yet because that would be you know we arranged this so that we have grandchildren why aren't there any that i think would be so i'd be interested to see culture to culture uh my prediction would be the extent to which marriage is arranged the extent to which that might not be a taboo topic at least within the family between families possibly but certainly not within families uh now depending on how narrowly or broadly you're going to define family but i mean reasonable extension i'd say would, would be sort of reasonable that um but um yeah the question as to why you have a certain number that you do uh it does seem to be a uh legitimate question um so considering i have children i have four so by the question why did we have four well four i thought was a good number because they could always uh always want to play with the other one so there would never be one on their own Two seemed like a bit of a small number. Four seemed a, a bigger one. I generally take a position of like natural law that can have the purpose of sex in part is procreation children and can having more of them is a good idea. You know, taking divine, divine command from the Bible, you know, be fruitful, multiply. That's kind of a good thing. Uh, so and also like birth rates among sort of ethnic English is not very high. So, you know, do a bit there. Why not have more than four? Well, become a bit more expensive at that point. House needs to be bigger or your standard of living goes down by a lot. And plus, they're really tiring. So you've got to stop. Well, you don't have to stop. But I kind of thought, well, I stop at some point. Um, if I uh, married earlier and my wife had been younger, may have had more because it gets more difficult when you get older physically and tiring and stuff and actually having them. So kind of thought four always seemed like a good number. And so uh, I've broken the taboo. Tim, why don't you have any kids? I have no idea. That's partly why I did this. Um, that's partly why I did this episode. It's an interesting topic to me. Um, probably cultural inertia would probably be the the two word answer here. Um, um, uh, you know, the 
we've been sufficiently uh, civilized to the point where instincts no longer exist here. So to a certain extent, we have to argue or reason all points in all areas here. So I, I do think that's to some extent why I'm doing this episode. Um, it's sort of an interesting question here. Um, um, I do think it's a question which needs to be asked. Uh, that's another reason why I did it. Again, I'm not supplying an answer. Uh, again, cultural inertia would be probably, you know, the there's no outlet for one thing. B, there's no there's no cultural pressure for really to have them either. You could argue there's some areas where some people will make comments, but in 2021, there's really no. You'd have to go looking for that kind of comments. You have to go wanting to hear those if you really want to hear it. No one really cares um, at that point in most. In certain areas, probably, but those are areas where you, you might already have them at this point. That's partly why I'm doing this episode. We've done a number of episodes on this. Are children overrated? Um, um, I think we did the episode on um, uh, we did the, well, we did the family one for story too. Um, uh, so, so that's why, partly why I'm doing this question here. Uh, it's an interesting topic. I think if if civilization is going to continue here, if you see the end of the Man of Steel movie, the beginning of the Man of Steel movie, it's sort of the first natural birth in like, you know, a thousand years or something on that society. I always thought that was sort of an interesting opening of a movie here, um, um, sort of a dead society here. Um, but those are my overall comments with them. Thanks for doing this episode. I think it was interesting here. Do you have any final comments? <laughs> interesting point following uh, the Man of Steel stuff uh, is – I suppose, in a way, the children are a lifeblood of the society because that's what makes it continue. Uh, and so the extent to which you, you have low birth rates and you can't even maintain your population, um, you could argue that's going to be um, an extent to which society is dead. As, also, I kind of think as well, one of the drivers behind a completely hysterical res response to coronavirus is due to the high average age of population. Because if most of the population were in their 20s, they simply wouldn't care. We know this from various psychological studies that the risk taking is higher amongst uh, the, the younger people. And uh, obviously, they don't be affected by it as much. And so they just go, well, screw it, let's do what we want. Uh, the extent to which you have a massive client older population, uh, particularly those who are susceptible to lots of mass media, um, then this gives the ruling class a greater justification uh, to do stuff. And of course, I I don't know if this is true. I wouldn't be surprised if agreeableness on um, psychological uh, traits goes up with age to some extent. It might go down again beyond a certain age, but I imagine it goes up the extent to which they're socialized. Because as you get older, you can become more socialized in a sense. And so uh, I think that sort of level of disagreeableness to a certain extent would have just have prevented to a large extent uh, a lot of the uh, restrictions. And of course, especially young men tend to be sort of the uh, the vanguard and the foot soldiers of any sort of revolution or counter revolution. And there'd have been a lot more of them. And uh, that, I think, would have changed responses. And it would be interesting to see response of the correlation of severity of response by governments to coronavirus um, relative to age of population. There may be no correlation at all, uh, but I certainly think the reaction to it uh, negatively could well be to do have some correlation with age. So there is sort of additional sort of um, well benefits in this case, really, is having um, more children having an overall younger society. But it's time now to thank everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends and family and subscribe to us on uh, Podbean and YouTube. Uh, the more subscribers we get, the higher we get in the search rankings. And if you'd like to contact the show for any reason, please contact us at mindcryandlibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcryandlibertyshow at gmail.com. <laughs>